Welcome to chapter 32. We're going to be talking about stuff that is beyond Earth. So we spent all of the previous chapters talking about rocks, the inside of the Earth, what the Earth is like. Now we're going to be leaving Earth. So in order to do that, we have to have a scale of the universe. The universe is absolutely enormous. And so throughout the next couple chapters, we're going to be talking about different ways of measuring what the scale is of the universe. How can we tell distances between, say, here and the moon, or here and the next closest star system? So let's start off with how we do that within our own solar system. The way we tell the distance to objects within our own solar system is something called radar ranging. What this basically is, is you're here on the Earth. Here's my little satellite dish. And you have an object. Let's say it's the moon, which is over here. The speed of light is constant in a vacuum. So if I launch, let's say, a radar beam or other things from the electromagnetic spectrum, it's going to take a certain amount of time for it to reach there, and then a certain amount of time for the echo to come back and reach our sensor again. Now, the speed of light being constant, we can then figure out exactly how far away that object is. So that works for objects that are within the solar system, asteroids, Jupiter, the moon, all of those types of objects. It doesn't really work for the sun, because the sun is emitting this type of radiation all the time. And so we're never able to pick up these tiny little things that should be bouncing back. The sun just washes it all out. Our second thing is triangulation. Now, this is an extremely oversimplified version, but that's what we're all about for PS100. So what this means is here's our sun. And our Earth is constantly in orbit around the sun. We have a semi-distant star, something that is on kind of the close side of our galaxy. Now, as we move from here to here, six months later, on the other side of the sun, this star's position is going to change relative to the stars behind it. The position is going to be off slightly, depending on our viewpoint from Earth. So what we do is we take a picture right here of how this star looks. Let's say this is January. Six months later in June or July, we take another picture of where the star appears to be. We know our distance from us to the sun. And look right here, we've got a right triangle. We're able to figure out these angles and figure out exactly how far away the star is. Now for this class, we're not going to expect you to be able to do that. You just have to know that for triangulation, that's for measuring stars that are close by, stars that are on our side of the galaxy. We don't really use this for figuring stuff out inside of our solar system, because the math is pretty crazy. But it works super well for finding stars that are close relative to the background array of stars. So we have two methods so far to tell stellar distances, triangulation as well as radar ranging. So with that, let's kind of go out through a tour of the solar system. So our solar system has a sun in the center of it. All of the planets orbit in the same direction on the same plane of the solar system. So if the sun is in the middle, all of the planets would be kind of parallel with my arm moving around here. So the closest planet to the sun is Mercury. Mercury is a rocky, sun-baked oven. The side that's facing the sun gets totally blasted by bombardments of radiation and heat. The side that is away from the sun is an ice-cold desert that is about the same temperature as space. Farther out from Mercury, and about the same size as the Earth, is Venus. Venus, named after the god of love, is actually a charbroiled, nasty, oven-baked, acidic place with temperatures that are much above what Earth is. Massive amounts of greenhouse gases have turned Venus into the modern equivalent of a hell. Slightly larger than Venus is Earth. Earth is our little blue planet. After that is Mars. Mars is the red planet, named after the god of war. Farther out from Mars, you have a belt of what are called asteroids. These asteroids mark the boundary between what are called the terrestrial planets, which means that they are the rocky cores, just kind of a rocky planet, and what are called the Jovian planets. So I'm going to move up here. The Jovian planets start with our big gaseous one, Jupiter. Now, these are not to scale. Jupiter would be absolutely enormous. Tons and tons of Earths could fit inside of Jupiter. Jupiter has a slight ring system, as well as the giant red spot. Farther out from Jupiter is Saturn. Saturn also has a ring system that is much more pronounced. Farther out from Saturn, we have Uranus. 
which is a blue planet that is flipped on its side. And farther out from that, Neptune. A much deeper blue planet. Now, these icy worlds are called the Jovian planets. Jovian is an old, old name for Jupiter. And we're going to talk in a few minutes about where these planets actually came from. But for now, we just kind of have a basic tour of what's going on here. As you'll notice, Pluto is actually classified as a dwarf planet. Pluto didn't make the cut. Now let's talk about the formation of the solar system itself. This is something called the nebular hypothesis. The nebular hypothesis just means that billions of years ago, the solar system was a giant cloud of rotating gas. This rotating gas eventually started to kind of collapse in on itself. So we have our cloud of gas here, which eventually starts to spin. It spins due to angular momentum, a concept we learned about in Unit 1. As this disk of cloudy gaseousness started to come together into spin, it began to flatten out, kind of like throwing a pizza dough up into the air. It flattened out with this bulge in the center. It kind of looks like a sombrero. This bulge in the center is the most dense and the warmest place for material to accumulate here. A nebula is just a cloud of gas and dust. That's where the name, the nebular hypothesis, comes from. Now, here in this disk, you have this process called accretion. Accretion is where you have small little particulates like sand and little fine dust that begins to build together like a snowball. You take a snowball, you put more snow on it, it becomes a larger snowball. Pretty sure you're able to roll it around on the ground and build a snowman. This is the exact same way that the planets and the sun were able to form. The pieces of material began to accrete together until they became the planets and the asteroids. So we have here these accreting planets that are starting to clear their orbits. That's one of the definitions of a planet, is it can't have anything large in its orbit. It has to accrete all of that stuff together, the dust, the cloudiness, all of that. Now, here in the center, it was warm. I'm not going to say it's hot, because space is very, very cold, but it was warmer than the surrounding interstellar stuff. And so it was warm enough that the ices, such as methane, other nitrogen gases, and kind of gaseous and icy water, couldn't really form out here. They didn't have low enough energy levels to be able to accrete. So the only stuff that could accrete were rocks, metals, the stuff that eventually came to become the terrestrial planets. So let me make this bigger. Here is what eventually became the sun. Right now it is what is called a protostar. And we have the terrestrial planets here. Right here is what is called the frost line. It's somewhere between Mars and Jupiter, kind of out by the asteroid belt. Right here is where that warmth from the sun ended. Beyond that frost line, you could have ices that could accumulate into the planets like Jupiter and Saturn. From our previous discussion, you know these are the Jovian planets. So to sum up, the sun was warm enough so that the only stuff that could accrete or accumulate would be rocky metallic particles. Outside of the frost line, it was cold enough for ices to be able to accrete and to develop together. Now let's talk about the forces and we'll end. The forces that are at work right now in the sun is not fusion. Fusion happens later. What's happening in the sun is you have hydrogen that is just coming together and mushing together. The gravitational potential energy is being converted to kinetic energy and heat. It's hot hydrogen that is just moving around, causing all of this warmth. Fusion has not started yet. The importance of this concept, I, I can't say it enough. Do not get this confused with a couple other concepts we talk about in later chapters. The concept of the Big Bang and the concept of the life of a star. This is the nebular hypothesis just for our solar system. Not the universe, doesn't talk about black holes, none of that. It's just for the formation of the solar system. We'll see you next video.